open on the most depressing rendition of Peace on Earth ever made. As two men and a little girl sneak in through the window of a library's basement. In the library itself is some kind of creature. Lum Lum's talking again. You've got one weird kid there. Where'd she get such a cutesy name for that monster anyway? I think he's the reason that her mother's Carl. This guy's name is Carl and he seems a little unbalanced. The other guy is the girl's dad who isn't named. Dad pulls Carl aside and tries to get him to be a little more sensitive because the girl Amy doesn't know yet that her mother is dead. Her mother's dead, as dead as my father, and that's just something she's going to have to get used to. Carl is why we can't have nice things. Pretty tough, aren't you? That's right. I'm tough. I was raised that way. My father, that damn thing is going to pay. So the creature above is an alien, and when it crash landed, it released a plague into the air, killing everyone in the area except for these three, and then put up a force field, trapping them inside. Everyone I knew in my entire life died in one weekend. Only four minutes in, and we're switching to the alien's point of view. I'm learning much about these primitive aliens. I've hooked up power source to local library pursuing research into their writings and examining their dead. He's trying to learn about humans and wants to know why these ones in particular survived the plague, but we don't know why yet. It turns out that it put up the force field to contain the virus as best it could. Meanwhile... Library! Of all places... Never even visited it now. Now I'm living here. Okay, Carl. <laughs> he reminds me of, like, the dorky younger brother of Roddy Piper's character in They Live. He's even crazy and ranty like Piper's wrestling persona. He's gonna want to see why it's plague didn't work on us. Maybe it just wants to eat us. Anyway, the next time they go out for food, Carl wants to get some weapons as well, but Dad isn't sure about that. He thinks it's possible that the alien isn't malevolent and killed everyone on accident, and he makes another good point. The alien dies while that force field is up. It's just possible we could be sealed in this town forever with 7,000 corpses. Of course, all this time they're hearing the alien talking to itself and Dad wishes he could understand. Meanwhile, Amy is overhearing more than she's letting on. Later that night, Amy hears the alien voice again, so she sneaks away into a vent and spies on it through the grating. He's just relaxing with a good book. Peekaboo! Aw, and it looks like he's friendly after all. The next day, the two guys are about to sneak up to the library to see what's been going on up there. It's up to something, and I want to know what. That's right, you do not throw rocks at a man who's got a wrench. And they tell Amy to yell if she sees the alien. You gotta keep a real careful watch, honey. We don't want to get caught upstairs by that monster. We don't want to be its next meal. She's already trying to tell them that it's friendly. <laughs> I give up. So they look around and find the books that Glim Glim has been reading. Philosophy, physiology, public speaking, anthropology, mythology, it's reading everything in the library. Yeah, I want to know all about us, I bet. Sorry, I can't stop laughing at Carl with his wrench. That intense music doesn't make him seem any more threatening. After some more searching, they find... <laughs> Oof, that's pretty gory for this show. I know him. Wait, Carl, you've got a wrench! Later, Glim Glim has discovered what the virus is. It turns out that it's a normal part of his own gut bacteria, but is deadly to humans. Also, that force field isn't gonna last forever. Force field will fail soon due to dying batteries. Then virus will contaminate entire planet. He knows he needs to communicate with Amy, since she's the only one who isn't afraid of him, but communication is difficult. I cannot bring my voice down to levels she can understand. Meanwhile, the two guys get back with food and weapons. While you were out looking for can openers, I paid a visit to Murphy's gun shop. Because that's the last time I run from that monster. Great, because if anyone should be wielding a firearm, it's crazy ass Carl. Trying to find a way to overcome the survivor's fear is of the utmost importance that they learn to trust me. Back to Glim Glim, he needs to examine the blood of the survivors. If I can duplicate their immunity, I will be able to save their race. 
Also, he's trying to learn how to write and isn't having much luck. The local moon is rising and snow is falling again. Reminds me of home. Long to be back with my younglings, but fear I shall never see them again. Oh, I'm sure you'll make it back home, Glim Glim. How will I bear the guilt of causing the death of an entire species? Would have to destroy myself. Anyway, in the middle of the night, he gets Amy's attention and tells her... Hi. <laughs> you call that writing? So she's going to teach him how to write. I always get A's in penmanship. What ends up happening is that he points to each letter he wants to write and she writes it. So far we've got that you're from Orion, that the sickness was an accident, and you need our help to make a medicine to save everybody else. He manages to get across that he needs a little of her blood. How much? A little? Okay, I... I guess I could help some, but it'll take an awful lot of convincing to get Carl and my dad to come around. She realizes that they won't be able to convince her dad and Carl that Glim Glim is friendly just by telling them, but maybe showing them somehow. I know! I know! The next day, the other two are wondering what Glim Glim has been up to because they can hear him moving around. It almost sounds like... like he's building something. That night, they've put together something that we can't see yet. Awesome! They gotta know you're a friend when they see that! But now he needs her blood. Your handwriting's getting better. I keep promise, didn't I? And it'll save the whole world, huh? Okay, but don't hurt me. No. Oh. So Glim Glim puts some kind of contraption on her arm to collect the blood. Meanwhile, Dad wakes up and notices she's missing. And of course, he ends up seeing this out of context. And he gets Carl. What have you done with her? That look on Carl's face. Fuck this guy so hard. Give her back! Oh, Glim Glim. Amy! But it's not over yet. Daddy, what was that noise? Glim Glim made it to show us he's our friend. Yeah, that Christmas tree is apparently what they were putting together. With everything that was happening, they forgot that it was Christmas Eve. Where's my friend Glim Glim? Please tell me you didn't hurt him. Daddy, you didn't hurt my friend Glim Glim, did you? Oh my god, we're right there with you, kid. Notice that Glim Glim never even blinked before, but now his eyes are closed. Merry Christmas. And so ends Glim Glim. In both ways that can be taken. Well, welcome to the episode of Monsters that just totally broke me. It's funny that the series started off so strong with the Fever Man, and then Holly's house was interesting, and then we got a couple that were just okay, and then My Zombie Lover, which was hilarious, and then a bunch of episodes that ranged from mediocre to pretty good, and then halfway through season one, we get totally slammed with Glim Glim. We're finally at the point where the show gets surprisingly good again, for the most part. The way the story plays out is interesting. It starts out on a low note, with these three being the only survivors of a disaster that was caused by an alien. But little by little, we learn that Glim Glim is friendly, is working towards fixing his mistake and saving everyone else. And he eventually makes friends with Amy, and it seems like things are starting to look up. Meanwhile, things get worse with the other two, as they see things out of context and are clearly believing that Glim Glim is their enemy. It can go either way, but I can imagine someone seeing this for the first time and hoping, maybe even expecting, a reasonably happy ending. Instead, the ending is like a punch to the gut. Not only does poor well-meaning Glim Glim die, but it was mentioned earlier that the battery powering the force field was about to run out, so most of humanity is doomed. Merry freaking Christmas indeed. I also want to mention that, even if it doesn't seem like it on the surface with how it ends, it does a pretty good job of avoiding the humans are bastards trope. I made fun of Carl because he's so hammy and a pretty blatant antagonist, but he mentions that everyone he ever knew died over a weekend and he clearly misses his own dad. 
It's really kind of understandable that he's crazy and vengeful. And Amy's dad, who is kind of on the fence for most of this, sees the alien who did all that appearing to do something harmful to his little daughter, who is all he has left, and he snaps. Hell, it's hard to tell, but despite Carl being in an action stance during this scene, it looks like it's actually the dad who is doing all the shooting. Not that I'm completely against the humans or bastards trope. It can be interesting, it's just that it's inherently nihilistic, and the story is plenty depressing and nihilistic enough without it. Plus, I just think it's kind of refreshing to see it avoided. Believe it or not, I actually really like Glim Glim's design. He's not made to be cute in any way. He looks a bit like a big ungainly plant with four solid red eyes, a vertical slit and some ridges for a mouth, and the top of his head looks like a brain. I'm sure that to a lot of people it looks cheesy, but I kind of like it. Until now, we've mostly had monsters that look human or like various animals and insects to varying degrees, but Glim Glim looks completely alien. He definitely isn't from around here. And hell, his ungainliness has a weird charm to it that makes him almost cute. He also reminds me of a book I stumbled onto years ago called Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, where Wayne Barlow did a series of paintings depicting some very strange races of aliens from various science fiction novels. Some of them are so bizarre that if I heard them described, I'd probably have a hard time picturing them. I'm not much of a reader, so I've never actually read any of these stories. So it was interesting seeing some of these odd designs rendered in a realistic way. Anyway, Glim Glim's design kind of reminds me of some of them. This one in particular. I guess. Also, I just noticed, is he supposed to look like a big Christmas tree? Glim Glim was played by Ken Walker, who is mainly a special effects guy, which makes sense. I assume he also did the voice since there's only one credit for Glim Glim. He also worked on Dogma, George of the Jungle, and Frankenhooker. He also did makeup effects for an episode of Tales from the Dark Side. Amy was played by Jenna Von Oy, who was probably best known for playing Six on Blossom. She was also in The Parkers. So that's about all I have to say about Glim Glim. It's definitely the best episode so far, if not one of the best in the series. One of the fun things about horror anthologies is that you never know what you're gonna get. Not only do you get varying tones, but the episodes are of varying quality. You end up getting some episodes that are mediocre or even just flat out bad, but then you get something like Glim Glim and it makes you remember why you liked the show in the first place. Next up is Parents from Space. See you then. So this is Christmas And what have you 